two speakers today, which I'm really excited about. Um, and this is the first one of our online uh, PD sessions. We've got two running. Um, our first speaker today is Judy Stewart from Luana College in Newborough. And she, um, we can all give her a bit of a clap actually, because she, poor thing, got awarded during an online session. Teacher, secondary school teacher of the year for the whole of Victoria, which is an amazing achievement. So well done, Judy. Good job. Thank <laughs> you. you had an online, very no audience ceremony, which is, was a bit depressing, but yeah, congratulations. And Judy's going to share um, some stuff that she, well, an ongoing program that she's run in her school over a number of years. Uh, Luana's been in Resource Month schools, I reckon, for at least six or seven years, quite Since a while. 2013. And she's done some really innovative and really um, things with uh, her school and some really nice, beautiful tech as well. So I'll let you share your screen. Hopefully we've worked that out. And um, it's no, right, well, my sharing still, <laughs> sorry. It's still disabled. It's just host disabled. All right, so let me... Um, Okay. If we can't get it working, I can make you a co-host and that way yes, you can share your screen. Can you do that, Simone? Just, sure can. just do that straight up. Will do. Okay, you're now co-host Judy, so hopefully that enables your screen. So down on the bottom there's a share screen um, button and then you just select which one you'd like, just like we did earlier today. Oh, here we go. There we go. Okay. Um, I'm going to mute myself now and, and let Me you too. kick off, Judy. No worries. Um, if anyone also wants to use the chat function for any questions, we probably don't have a huge amount of time for questions because we've got the two speakers today. We've got Andrea coming up. Um, so uh, if, if, but anyway, if you've got some quick questions, we'll, we'll see if we've got time to answer them. Okay. All and right. Can everyone um, else please mute themselves as well? That'd be great. Thanks. All right, guys, so Luana College, we've got roughly a thousand students, years seven to ten. We've got um, a few, um, few programs, sporting excellence, music, but in particular in relation to sustainability, we've got agricultural studies and an animal care program. And one of the things that most people are interested in is our Green Traders Gardening Program. We've also got an Indigenous food, food plant and gardening program, looking gardens that have done, been done sustainably, um, a fruit orchard, a butterfly garden, technology program and a leadership for sustainability program. So they're all of those things that if you're interested that you can talk to me about as we go through or at the end. Um, we were lucky enough to be um, to be finalists for the Zayed Sustainability Prize and were flown over to Abu Dhabi two years in a row to um, uh, unfortunately we didn't win but we did get a lot out of it. Okay, so we learnt a lot. Um, so we, in the application process we got to learn about lots and lots of different types of sustainability and technologies and things like that and one of the new technologies that's coming to the forefront is about um, piezoelectricity, okay, which is uh, electricity produced by vibration, so a bridge with a car going over it, the bridge vibrates and the vibration um, squashes crystals and produces electricity. So all the lighting for the bridge, and you can have lighting in a building, for example, which is created by vibration from people walking through it. So it is the new style of energy that's um, coming to the forefront. Um, our students had a Google Owl um, project and we installed them in the adjacent forest to the school. And here's a picture of the kids in the background there, so in front of the um, uh, the cherry picker. So we had about, I think we had about eight kids in that project. And next, just I've got a list of the different programs. So leadership for sustainability program. We've run leadership programs in the past, but this is our first student leadership for sustainability. So it's specifically for sustainability. We've got um, Wicking Gardens and I've done the calculations and they're definitely 50% um, water, more water efficient. And they also use recycled uh, milk bottles in the bottom, which, in, which I think 
created buy-in because we got the kids to bring them into the school. So the parents are donating the milk bottles, the kids are bringing them in, and then to know that they're in their garden, um, I think just gets the kids more interested. Um, the next activity, or we have an outdoor classroom now, which is out in the garden area. And I've got a, a proposed mushroom house. So that's, um, that's on the, what would you call it, in the process of being contented. So there are the little round earth domes and they're very temperature stable. Um, so I just think it's one more thing for the students to understand. Um, we have a flatbed and vertical wall aquaponics system and I've got a, a little bit of a photo of that later. And we're proposing to put in solar panels and LED lighting. So with our school and I suppose with most schools, um, our bill is our bill is about 150,000 per year. And so if we put in $450,000 worth of solar panels and, um, and cover all of our energy expenses, so we save that 100 to 150,000 a year and then over the life of the panels, which is guaranteed to be 25 years, we save $2 million. And there's, um, I think there's an, a, a program, a government-based program going out at the moment where if you do this, you actually get half of the savings to use in your school. So I would consider looking that up. Um, we also have technology models, uh, solar cars, wind and solar generators, and we're proposing to have some little model biodigesters so that kids can understand all of the different types of energy usage. Um, we actually ran a program at the school and, we, and here's a picture of somebody on the, um, the push bike smoothie maker. So then they get to understand that human powered energy is just as efficient, or well, more efficient, isn't it? And, um, and it's fun. Um, our Leadership for Sustainability program, we ran an outward bound camp. Uh, they learned about different leadership styles. We discussed open integrity in both communication and in leadership. And we ran some courage development programs, risk management activities, and as you can see in the photo, we have some resilience development happening. <laughs> so that, um, that photo was taken after a, I think a three or a four hour hike through the snow in snowshoes. Um, we have taken two groups of students to the AYCC uh, Switched on School Summit. So this is the group from 2017 and then the next one's from um, 2019. The, so during this activity, the kids learned a great deal about climate change and the environment and what they can do to help. I thought that was a really valuable experience. I had to fight to get the students to go though. It is considered to be a political action. And so to have, I don't know about primary schools, but secondary schools, there's a little bit of a, um, there's certainly a discourse about, about whether it's political or not. Okay, the next one. Um, sustainability and recycling in our school. So we have mobile phone recycling. We've got aluminium cans, which we, we actually donate the cans to the scout, local scout group and they get money for them. We have food recycling from the kitchens and in the corridors in the junior school and the senior school, but not in the middle school because we tried that several times and the middle school kids just kept putting the wrong thing in there and tipping it over and being silly. So but rather than having to clean that up every day, we just put a lid on that for the moment. Um, the, um, for the person who asked about how the wicking gardens are made, so don't use builder's plastic, right? Even though you might go online and even in the ABC um, uh, instructions on how to do it, yeah, just pop some builder's plastic in there. It is not food friendly. So I've used um, reservoir plastic, okay, which is, which is food friendly. So milk, milk bottles in the bottom with holes in and then the reservoir plastic and then the sand and then the felt and then the soil, okay? And there's also, if you can see in the corner, I don't know if you, can you see my cursor? Yeah, okay. 
So in that in the corner there is the fill pipe. Yes, sorry, I can see it. <laughs> yep. I'm not used to using Zoom, so I kept looking for the microphone button. Yep. Um, yeah, I like the milk bottle idea. Yep. Um, because I wanted to do an IBC tank one, or I'd seen mm. that done. Yep. Um, but you know, milk bottles are something that people have anyway. So yeah. Um, I, yeah, I like that idea. Yep. No worries. Um, so we've got in the staff room, we've got the cashy composting bins. So we've just got a little spray bottle. Um, with the Bakashi stuff in it and you don't have to read all that but if you're interested in Bakashi um, just do a screenshot or something like that um, and can I say that we don't it recommends keeping the stuff in there for two weeks or something like that we never do that because we don't want that hanging around for that long take it um, once a week once or twice a week over to the worm farms and we put it straight into the worm farms initially I took the juice out of them and I was putting it on the plant but when I was actually um, organising this, uh, this PowerPoint, I was doing some research and discovered why my plants died. It's incredibly acidic apparently, so I don't recommend putting it on your plants. It's better, and the worms, I, seriously, I don't know if you can see me. I had handfuls of worms in my worm farms after putting this stuff in there. The worms love it, so I do recommend it. Um, our Leadership and Sustainability Program ran a whole school energy audit and they took room temperatures, light levels, drafts, appliance energy use, heaters, fans, and they also installed please turn off lights and fan signs, which to most people you would think, oh yeah, well that's sort of standard, isn't it? But it's probably, out of, out of all of these things, it's probably saved us the most money. That would be my guess because just a gentle reminder to turn off the lights. We were having lights on perhaps up to eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night when the cleaners finished or something like that. And here's just this gentle reminder that could save me $40,000 for the year. They teachers turn off the light when they leave at three o'clock. Um, we are also in the sweat water saving program. It costs about $150 a year. It's open to all schools as far as I know. They monitor the water and, and if you want electricity, it would be another 150, but we're just sticking with the water at the moment. Um, in the first year of installation of this, we saved $10,000. Right? So we had projected energy, um, sorry, water costs, and they found some really big leaks. So, yeah, they, I think um, SWIP actually used our school as a case study because it was such a, made such a difference. Okay, next one. Um, we had energy, um, Ian Southall with his energy trailer visit the school. So he's got life-size activities for the kids to engage in, all about different types of energy things and he will go, I think he would probably go all over Victoria. So anybody who's interested in real, real life energy saving to show the kids. You can contact him just through the internet. But amazing, right? My kids, my classes have absolutely loved it and they're very engaged. We also had a sustainability speaker come to the school. Now this young man that's in the picture is Toby Thorpe. Um, I met him when he was 15, so he was the Australian ambassador to Zayed, to Zayed when we went over there. He rang us and told us what to expect. He's a 15 year old student helping us and telling us what to do and how to do it. Um, so I invited him to our school and he explained to the students at our school. Sorry, was there a question? No, I can't hear. Um, yeah, he explained to the students in our school what a country student can do. So here's a young man who's traveling now all over the world. Um, he, I think he went to the World Climate Coalition. Um, he's set up a speaking program and I believe he had his 18th birthday having dinner with the French president discussing sustainability. So a mere student from a country school can do this. So he's available if you want to contact him, he, can, he is very willing to come to your school and talk to your students. 
We also ran the, uh, the 2040 Sustainability Movie, which is available through Resource Smart Schools through Alison. So thank you for that, Alison. Um, we set up a green purchasing policy, and I, I'm hoping that you can read this because this was actually probably for me a real coup because I've been trying for like I think six years to try and get something in where we could just consider the environment as well as cost. And if you have a look down there at the aim, the aim says to promote a green purchasing culture throughout the school by considering the financial, social and environmental impact of the goods, okay? So just that word in there doesn't mean they have to do it, but they are allowed now, right? So they're allowed to consider the environment as well as the cost when they're buying something. Okay, now this next one is um, in, in 2013, I, I was awarded uh, a prize for innovative sustainable fuel experiment. So this is ethanol from potatoes. The ethanol is brewed and distilled, so the students actually um, make it from, from the potatoes themselves. It takes two weeks. And then we distilled it and put the fuel, the ethanol into a transier and the students used it to cook marshmallows. So proving that the ethanol can be used as a fuel and it's not just something that you drink. And for those people who might be interested, the very next slide is the how-to. So if you're interested, just take a, a screenshot. Okay, so very simple. Three kilos of potatoes, some sugar, water to cover the potatoes, normal bread maker's yeast, just one little sachet of that, sprinkled it over the top. And then um, depending on the temperature or the time of year that you do it, so if it's cold, then you might want a heat lamp on it or an incubator, whatever you're going to do if you've got it for school, or um, it'll just take a bit longer if it's at a lower temperature, but you can still do that. Um, now, something else that's very, really, really valuable at our school is our Green Traders Program. Um, so we've got, so one day a week, we have three garden volunteers coming into the school and we work with probably between 30 and 40 students over a day. And those students, some of them are like interested in horticulture, of course, and some of them are disengaged. So of the students that are disengaged, we find that they are coming into school on the Thursday specifically for this program. So it is a very engaging program, really valuable for kids, really valuable. Um, most schools and so on are involved in community tree planting, so I don't think that's anything different, but that's through the council if you're interested. Um, now, our something else that's different, our Ag Port Studies, Agriculture Horticulture, we've got Farming with a Difference, so we are running permaculture concepts through it, um, talking to the students about increasing trees, about the mini water cycle, and some people haven't even heard of the mini water cycle, let alone teach it, um, talking about how it man maintains the grass and reduces the need for hay or special cropping, and of course then reduces impact of farming on the environment and the climate. Um, just lower down on the slide, I've talked about um, the attendance of the students during these programs, and I actually, it's, I'm not just saying that it's gone from 30 to 80 percent, it did. I, I checked through the kids, some of the disengaged kids, um, started attending 80% during this program. And right down the bottom, we've had students asking about farming and sustainable farming. And there is, there is some feedback now that sustainable farming is becoming like the new, new sexy, if that makes sense. It's not meant to be rude. Okay, our ag court study. So we're proposing, propose, blah, blah, blah. Um, we promote using the chicken and hen manure in the compost and sawdust is recycled from our woodwork rooms and after it's been used for the animal bedding. So we have chickens and we also 
have calves. So um, we usually run through the Cows Create Careers program, which can be primary or secondary. And during that program, we educate the students about the grass, eating grass or hay instead of grain because it is the grain that is producing the rear end methane gas. Okay, so um, apparently in the feedlots over America, there's actually, you can determine that there's a much higher content of methane over there. We have an indigenous plant butterfly garden. Um, top picture, you can see the students painting the bench here. We have Grevillea, we have Veronia, and the bottom one is, some of you have to tell me how to pronounce that, but I think it's Camelutia. I'm not sure. But anyway, so they're all um, good for butterflies. We've also got the rock garden, and for, they need the rocks for mating on, and they need the rocks to be near water. So, so there's, um, we also have a water supply. Um, our wicking garden. So we have actually got 40, 40 square metres of wicking garden beds. And then just to the left of me in that picture, you can see some barrels that the kids have made wicking gardens out of. And that's including having the milk bottles in the bottom of those. So the kids made the blue ones themselves. And they started the wooden one, but the amount of time and the expertise that was required, we ended up getting the Newborough Men's Shed to come in and finish them off. Okay, we also have an indigenous food plant garden. And I have to give you a warning. Not many people know what indigenous food plants look like. And unfortunately, we spent $1,500 on plants, for example. And um, a year later, we had about $100 worth left because nobody recognised them. They were ripping them out as weeds. Okay, so. So they need to be fenced and they need to be labelled, okay, if you're going to have put in um, an indigenous food plant gun. Um, where the, our next project is some native native bee boxes, or yeah, I've heard of calling them um, insect hotels. And the bonus of this is that native bees don't have a sting. Therefore, you're not, um, so students who might be allergic to, to bees, or anaphylactic to bees, there's no sting, no bite, therefore no anaphylaxis. So they're a safe, a safe means to have out in the school garden. Um, can I ask about the bee hotels? Have you had many native bees visiting? Um, I've been no. trying. <laughs> ah, okay. It's proposed. So that is our next project. We haven't. So now, but I have seen, I have seen some native bees in the local garden. So I'm assuming that if we put it in, that it will work. Yes. Yep. And um, I have I've banned uh, sprays because I've heard of another school who put them in and said no, we didn't get any. And I thought, yeah, I wonder. We've banned sprays for oh, since 2013, since I took over. So that's seven years. So in that seven years, if there were sprays and so on used prior to that, then at least the the, uh, the level that's present should be low enough for the bees, the native bees to come in and we are seeing the native bees. So I think hopefully, hopefully we'll get some in there. Um, can I just ask maybe for Sharon Ray to pop in here? Because Sharon, you've got the most amazing insect hotel I've ever seen ever in my life. It is stunning, um, Alison. It is stunning. Have you got some insects in it? Um, so I'm going to talk about this next week, but just uh, briefly, we do audit every year we've had it. Uh, this is coming up to two years since it's been put in. Um, and because we're relying on primary school students to do the auditing process, it's probably a little bit more organic, let's say, than it would be than scientific. Um, and at this stage, we can't make any claims that it's increased the insect biodiversity in that area. However, it is a stunning piece of work. And um, there, is, there are certainly insects in the, the Bee Hotel, and I'll have some photos of that next week for, the, for our session there. Beautiful. Thanks, Sharon. <laughs> and any, any advice, I'll ask you next week if there's any advice that you can give me. Beautiful. All right, now then, our Green Tradings. Our Green Tradings program is based on this um, planting guide, right? So we've got, 
We've actually set up a planting guide so that they've got weekly planting and then understand that there's seasonal planting. Um, so we've got them set up for each, each term. And then down below that, we've got a rotation roster of jobs. So garden duties, um, whether you're watering or fertilising or weeding or um, um, going around the school and getting some prunings off different, different plants, picking up leaf litter, all of those things. This is focused around compost. Okay, so it's about sustainable gardening. It's not just about gardening, it's about being sustainable. Compost is the means of being sustainable. So we're getting the food waste from the worm farms, food, you know, um, and from the school, all of the kids in the schools and the kitchens, for example, going into the compost and then coming back into this, into this garden. So we've got the, the duty roster there, we've got the planting, and um, so Whilst we've already got the green tradies, our next step is to try and run a program where the students, so now I'll go back just one slide. So 40 week program where we have students coming out roughly once a term to go into the garden to learn specific things about the garden, okay? Now, when I say once a term, just one period per term because there's some evidence that um, what we call staggered, staggered schooling is more effective than doing block schooling in these aspects. So block schooling would be to say, yeah, wait till they're in year 10, send them out there for a whole week, tell them what you want them to know, and then let them go. But that doesn't help them see the changes, that doesn't help them invest in, in the planting. So if they plant something, they don't get to see it grow if it's block schooling. Okay? Um, they don't get to um, do the seed collection. They don't get to see how the compost changes over time. So this is a proposal where they go out five times a year for a period for for year seven through to nine and hopefully I'm hoping to be in year ten but I'm, I suspect that they won't accept that as a, as a proposal. But anyway, so because it's the staggered schooling, there's supposed to be a high level of investment and a high level of learning over that amount of time. So that, that's our next our next step of project, as well as the mushroom house and the bee, bee hotel. Okay, so um, all of these things that I've shown you, um, I have sent through to Alison Taylor. And if anybody's interested in the program, then you can get those, those documents from her. And there we go. Thank you for inviting me to present this information that's um, hopefully of value and relevance to you and has been from our airport and our school programs. Thank you very much. I'm honoured to be here. Uh, Judy, I might get you to just stop your sharing of your screen. Sure. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, we might just have a couple of minutes if anyone had any questions about that. It's a very information rich presentation. Has anyone had any have any questions? Okay. Um, Beck, I might let you introduce Andrea if that's okay. Yep, that's fine. Um, I'm just yep, yeah, Andrea's here. Um, Andrea, I've put together a few um, photos for you. Um, so Andrea Savage is a uh, teacher at Nagel College and she's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, and she's been working for quite a few years um, doing in, like teaching environmental science across all year levels. Um, so I know she's so, so busy. So. I haven't actually asked her to put a presentation together. Instead, I'm just going to interview her. So I've got a few questions um, that, yeah, I'll ask Andrea just as, as part of our presentation. So if I just share my screen, we'll be able to hopefully see some of the photos um, that Andrea's been doing. So hello, Andrea. Can you, can you? Um, Hi there. Hi there. I've, I've had I haven't turned my camera on, but tell me if you want it on. I've got my mic on, though. So oh, you put your camera on. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can oh, hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll just try and 
see if I can share my screen. Um, you have to bear with me a bit. So, um, let me know if you can see my screen. Just see you at the moment, Beck. Oh, okay. Um, I might need some help. <laughs> Vicky, if you just go down to the bottom where it says share screen. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> yeah, I did that, but I was pressing on the little, the wrong arrow, sorry. <clears throat> okay, here we go. That's got it. Is that working? Yeah. Seems to be. Okay, there we go. So I'm Beck Lample, I'm the Resource Smart Schools Facilitator for East Gippsland um, and yeah, introducing Andrea. Um, so these are the list of questions. Um, I might, I'm just wondering how we should do this if I go through the questions and then um, and then do the photo. So Andrea, can you please tell us a bit about yourself? So um, what environmental courses do you run at Nagel and how long have you been teaching these courses? Um, okay, so uh, environmental science, VCE environmental science is new to the school, relatively new. So I currently have a year 12 class uh, and a year 10 class and we, we didn't have enough kids to run a year 11, which is sad. Uh, had a class of 10, 11 and 12 last year. Uh, so that's, that's the exciting thing and I think that's the growth that's come out of running uh, the Year 9 Eco Warriors program. So that is a, a Year 9 elective. It goes for nine weeks. Um, we have uh, 25 kids per class. So we can get through, um, can offer 100 students a year the opportunity to be a Year 9 Eco Warrior. And then that is a, a natural um, pathway to, v uh, to Year 10 Environmental Science, which is a semester-based uh, subject, uh, six-month subject. And then, um, then, we, um, uh, allow, then we go into uh, VCE Year 11 and Year 12 Environmental Science. So, so that's what's, um, what's evolved in the last couple of years. And we've been running Eco Warriors, uh, Mitchell River Eco Warriors it's called, uh, probably uh, since 2007, so um, for ages. And um, I think we first had the idea of running this elective in 2005, so we've, we've certainly been doing it for a while as a Year 9 subject. Um, and yeah, I, I am, um, actually I did a degree in horticulture, with, but when I left school and uh, so this is really just a, a really sneaky way of me getting my green finger on at um, at school but I'm also a science teacher obviously uh, and so um, we have a fantastic growing facility at Nagel College and when I came to Nagel College in 2003 it wasn't being used um, and I basically have this fabulous resource to um, to grow uh, plants with kids and for kids and for staff and for the community and and then as a result of uh, that facility and this year nine elective we were able to uh, bring into the school this opportunity to reinstate native uh, rainforest vegetation which is nationally threatened uh, vegetation along our riverside escarpment and we have a situation where we have no fence between any classrooms and the Heritage Mitchell River, which is a, a very unusual situation and, and a very um, privileged situation to be able to teach in this beautiful facility uh, at the bottom of our school. Go back to the questions. Um, so to be an eco-warrior, what 
what do the year nine students, what do they have to do? Is it a year long subject? So it's only nine weeks, uh, eight, nine to 10 weeks, depending on what the school curriculum is uh, doing. But in terms, of, um, in terms of how they choose it, they choose it in year eight, when they're in year eight, uh, for the subject, uh, for the year ahead. So most kids hear that it's the, a great program, uh, you know, to do. Everyone wants to be an eco warrior. Not every kid gets to do it. If we uh, have too many um, students for uh, the places available, um, but but we also run it as an excursion based subject. So not, we don't just work at the school. We we get the kids out along the Mitchell River, uh, through the whole community, extending sort of along a 100 kilometre transect, effectively. Um, and that is to get them outside of the school and to see uh, the bigger picture of the uses and the importance of the Mitchell River. And so how do you fund the program for planting the seedlings? And Yeah, we certainly couldn't do it without uh, the help of, of East Gippsland Land Care Network. Um, really, that has been integral to being able to do the things that we do. Um, and being part of a land care group, so we are a Nagel uh, land care group, that allows us to um, that allows us to tap into the the funding that's available, uh, and that is really all as a result of of, of the work we do. Uh, and you can see in this photo here, uh, along the um, escarpment of the river, uh, we are improving the the the, um, the runoff uh, to the river. So so we are able to we're able to achieve tangible outcomes when it comes to improving river and lakes health. And so it is through through our connection with East Gippsland Land Care Network and East Gippsland Catchment Management Authority that we gain the funding to buy the seed, the seedlings, the materials we need to grow the plants with the students uh, to revegetate this area. So, and I'll just show you. This slide here as well was pretty fascinating. Can you explain <laughs> some of this one? <laughs> well, now going down in history is probably the most uh, important photo that <laughs> we've ever taken at the site because within one photo frame are two echidnas and two red belly black snakes. And uh, you know, we, we know we have good rich biodiversity, but to get that snap as one snapshot of the richness of our biodiversity is pretty fantastic. Um, now we, we do know we have snakes in this environment and that does scare teachers enormously and it scares me, don't worry. Um, you can just imagine the mitigation that's involved in, in running uh, excursion based classroom activities beside a river in the environment where there are um, you know, uh, poisonous snakes. Poisonous yeah. snakes, toxic snakes. Yeah, well, so, yeah, better, certainly better that they're not um, tiger Sorry. snakes. I was gonna say better they're not tiger snakes. <laughs> At least they're mm. red belly blacks. Well, we do have, that's right, we're much happier to have the red belly black and certainly uh, the more venomous tiger snake is really concerning and we do have we have got a resident tiger snake in the environment. So we just have to be really, really careful about teaching kids how to share their environment. And, and it, that becomes a new area of, of um, education. You know, humans have to share their environments with these uh, less, uh, less favourable species and, and we can't just exclude them. And, and that is part of the really important learning environment as well. Um, teaching, teaching everybody, not just the kids, but also the staff, that we need to share our environment and in our crashing and plummeting biodiversity that's occurring uh, at the moment on our planet, we really have to up this understanding of, of sharing our environment. For sure. Um, so how have you gone um, in the lockdown and the remote learning? How, have you had to readapt? the Eco Warrior program or the other um, part of it too? Yeah, that's a great question, Beck, because of course, you know, the, 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 the attraction uh, to the subjects that, that I'm teaching at the moment are pretty much all about the practical opportunities. 
uh, for students. And so uh, with the remote classroom, I've had to actually invent uh, lots of small projects that uh, get the kids off screen as much as possible. So I've been really lucky um, enough to put up a uh, biodiversity in your backyard assignment that I just, you know, came up with um, at the, big, at the first re at Ning remote round one, um, which is quite a involved sort of assignment, but it gets kids connecting to their own actual backyard and it's getting them off screen by getting them to draw a mud map. Um, so they take an aerial view of their backyard and I've given them an example of a mud map. Some of the works of art that have come back have been pretty amazing, including the um, inclusion of parents in this, which has been really good. So some parents who are really into their gardens have got the kids with the botanical names of this, the biotic factors and um, you know, really helps the kids with some of the ID, which is great, that's just an extra bonus. But that biodiversity in your backyard has been centred around enhancing kids' understanding of what biodiversity is and why it matters. Uh, so it, it, it includes a bunch of small clips, uh, some YouTube clips, some um, little work tasks that are on screen, but predominantly pretty much a surveying of their backyard and then um, sort of taking it to the next level and asking them how they could improve the biodiversity of their backyard it sort of all comes back to um, putting out water vessels, shallow water bowls. Um, they all say, no, there's nothing they could do, you know, but they could all actually plant some new plants or put out some pot plants if it's a rental. But even if it's a rental, they can certainly uh, facilitate water in the environment. And we've sort of come to, to learn, especially here in my own environment, um, in my own um, garden, uh, we've we've now got nearly 40 vessels of water that are out around our garden. It's an enormous job trying to keep up with um, keeping them all topped up in summer. But we have noticed an increased amount of visitors to the garden through the water. It's it's really really important. That's amazing, especially given the drought as well that we've had in East Gippsland. Um, yeah, putting the water out's been a really Thing. Um, that sounds amazing, that biodiversity in your backyard. Um, I'm sure there'd be teachers, um, yeah, that would like to kind of learn more about that. That's really good. And it could could be adapted yeah. as well for the primary as well as secondary. Yeah. Yeah, certainly could be. I mean, you know, it gets them taking some photos as well. So I've really, it's really about just trying to get them off screen but also uh, have some consolidating time where they are actually understanding the concepts. And, um, and consolidating on those concepts. But it is, it's, it's so important to get the kids practical in a remote classroom and in a remote way. So the, there's probably lots of other good ideas that people have had in this time. This is just something I came up with and I'm, it's got heaps of room for improvement, but um, it's certainly something I can offer and I can share it in a Google, uh, a shared Google document mm -hmm. later on. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, I'll just go back to this one. Can you just ex um, describe this tree and explain um, the significance of this tree in this picture? Sure. So our school was situated on the site that it's at on the Linden Eye Road in Bansdale. Um, that particular site was chosen by the current the, the principal at the time because of this beautiful heritage tree. Uh, there's a forest red gum, um, a eucalyptus teratocornus, and uh, we use it as a teaching tool for so, on so many levels. Certainly from a cultural heritage perspective, I find this tree really, really powerful. Um, and one of the things that we, we say to the kids when, when they first come in as an eco-warrior, I take them to, to this tree, um, which we've since named the spirit tree with our local Indigenous group, uh, Bunjil Baluk. Is its cultural name uh, and we and I say to the kids you know this tree is estimated to be 350 years old from a from an arboricultural estimate um, tell me what you think this tree has seen and we go right back to you know 350 years on on the site and we talk about white invasion and uh, the significance of a tree like this to the Gunai Kurnai people um, and now this was the local supermarket uh, and the really sad thing that we say is well this is called you know we call it uh, a forest red gum 
And I say to the kids, uh, where's the forest? Because I can only see one tree. And so that brings up a whole new arena of, of teaching, um, you know, about uh, <laughs> and the reasons why this particular plant now has um, national protection as a rare and threatened species. So one of the things we do that is not so depressing is we collect the seed off this tree and we grow new seedlings fro from this tree. So we're actually keeping the provenance of the tree, but we're also growing that seedling up to a size uh, that is able to be given away to our graduating year 12s. And, and that's become a, a legacy that we do at the end of every year. Um, every year 12 graduates with a small bundle of a look, um, which is uh, just a really nice thing to take away from the school. Um, and I've had parents for years later sending photos in of themselves um, at, um, uh, of, them, of, their, of themselves or with their kids as this tree that they got as a graduating year 12 has grown. And, and certainly, yes, we use Bruce, Bruce Pascoe. And so I've got some really exciting um, uh, Murnong daisy plants that have been recently planted under the spirit tree, which Bruce Pascoe actually grew and I got the seed from him, um, which is just a little claim to find, but it's quite, it's quite fab fabulous. So. Yep, that's that's fantastic. Um, so just looking at the time, we're probably running a bit out of time. Um, there's also this Instagram um, page that you've set up that's got lots of photos too that people can um, go and have a look. I'll see if it'll share. Um, no, it's not. Uh, it's a, it's actually yeah. That's it's just uh, the address is. Um, yeah, the address is the Nagel under slash rainforest under slash project. That's the address on Instagram. Yeah. may not come up if you click on it. It might come up. Okay. Um, I'm going to send out um, some information to everybody who's attended from Judy. So I'm happy to just send out that link with the information. Um, okay. Okay, so I'll just finish with one more question, Andrea. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time today to um, outline some of the work you've been doing. Um, if you've got one piece of advice for another teacher about designing and running revegetation projects, what would that be? Get some really good sleep at night. It's really, really exhausting. <laughs> um, and everyone who who uh, does this kind of stuff knows that. I think the really important thing is to get leadership on your side. You can't go anywhere unless you have the blessings of leadership um, who will be ultimately backing you with the issues you have taking kids outside. They'll be looking after your um, well-being as well because they'll hopefully understand how important it is to get our kids outside and get connected with nature. I think the really important thing to, to, to be mindful of is the fact that more and more in society we are losing contact with nature. That's because we're not immersed in nature enough and we're becoming more removed from understanding how important nature is to all living beings, let alone just humans. So keep the fundamental, um, keep the fundamental idea of the fact that we need nature for our health and that should be enough to push you on to, to, to really believe in, in getting this program that you want to happen at your school up because ultimately everybody's well-being depends on getting connected to nature and, and, get, and running a revegetation project no matter how small or large it is is going to connect you and your students to nature. So I think just, just that's really important believe in it because it is right and it is absolutely totally necessary yeah totally agree i think just getting kids out in nature is so important for that as well um so we might finish there i'm just wondering if anyone's got any questions for andrea and how do i stop sharing my screen <laughs> can you see can, I, <laughs> can you see the um instagram page or can everyone see that no no oh, okay i'll stop sharing okay no worries <laughs> i 
I suppose I should say something now. Um, thanks everybody for coming along. That's a re it was, and thank you so much to Judy and Andrea for sharing your wisdom with us. I hope that you got some great ideas. I know I certainly um, got a lot out of um, listening to both presenters and their different approaches, particularly in a secondary school setting. That's really fantastic. Um, we will send you out a PD certificate for your PD uh, hours. Um, so I feel like I've got everybody and everybody on a list, but if you don't receive one and you would like one, please just email me. You've, I'm pretty sure you've all got my email address or Simone. So we'll, we will sort that out with you. Um, I've got some information from Judy that she sent me earlier today. So I'll also email that out to you as well as the Instagram link. Um, our next session is on the 16th. Simone, is that right? We're not, yes, good. Um, and Simone, do you want to maybe just give us a heads up on the speakers on the 16th? Am I putting you on the spot or you just have to unmute yourself? That's okay. Thanks, Alison. We've got our primary school showcase next week. So we had secondary today, but primary is next week. We've got um, Sharon Ray from Ara Lewin. Thank you so much, Sharon. Uh, if you're still with us, thank you in advance. Um, it's always good to hear from you and what wonderful things are happening there. And we've also got Debbie Guy from, who's also joined us today. Thank you again, Debbie. Debbie Guy from Gray Street Primary School in Terelgan, who will be talking about their Fighting Extinction Program, which does sound fabulous. So thank you to both of those speakers in advance. And I look forward to seeing everybody, hopefully, for that one too. Yeah, brilliant. Um... Just a heads up, my uh, eight-year-old daughter just gave me a tip with Zoom that if you want to talk, you just press the space bar and it unmutes you. So, and it works vice versa as well. So I've just learned something today uh, about Zooming and um, some better Zoom practices. So that's very good. Well, I wish you all a lovely afternoon. Enjoy this gorgeous sunshine, that, the little bit that's left and, you know, for the coming days. And we will see you uh, next week. Um, oh, and just one last thing. If you haven't logged on to your Resource Smart Schools account, if you haven't been harassed by us yet, if you could please log on, you can tick off that you were at this training or you can tick off in the core module, the second action to say that you've checked your details. It helps us with our numbers in terms of um, the delivery of our contract with Sustainability Victoria uh, and helps us with our funding. So if you wouldn't mind, it probably will take you five minutes, but it's super helpful to us. So. That's all from me and our team. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.